some GP lenses. And I will uh, tell you that, as was mentioned by Solu, I'm um, primarily associated with the GP Lens Institute, and I've been a teacher for about 40 years. So GP lenses in 2020, what is going on uh, that's new in that regard? Well, we know internationally, it is you look back about 10 years ago when Phil Morgan's article in Contact Lens Spectrum, the International Contact Lens Prescribing, they looked at 24,000 fits internationally and found about 9% of fits and refits were in the area of GP lenses, predominantly spherical. Now, if we, we jump forward to this past year, again, a similar number of fits internationally that they evaluated and they found actually 14% of all new fits were GPs and 11% were spherical and 3% were worth okay. So that's, that's very encouraging. And about one out of every seven is in sclerals and that of course is going up. In the US, and this was from January, we see about 11% if you include hybrids. So about one in nine being fit in GPs. So they still have a significant place uh, in our toolbox for fitting contact lenses. In the US, what do we fit? Well, if you include corneal is 75%, if you include ortho K, that actually makes it 83%. Um, and then you see 5% hybrid, 13% scleral. And again, that is going up. In our annual report, which we have every October in contact lens spectrum, we'll look at what are the most important developments in the past year. And we'll also survey the responders to see what, uh, survey the readership to see what they fit. And again, you can see conventional corneal lenses being the, the most uh, popular, but look at sclerals. You know, sclerals are probably around 26% uh, of what they fit. And then all the others are kind of, you know, mole-like vocals about 10%, torics, major 9%, non-sclerals or irregular cornea are about 11%. So again, sclerals going up, conventional corneal going down. Well, we've got the October issue coming up next month. So I already know what they responded this year. We surveyed the GP Lens Institute Advisory Board and we, we think they're an outstanding group of specialty lens fitters. And what did they think were the biggest advancements in 2020? The, the first three were very close in terms of their responses, having a wettable 200 DK material. Uh, in, in the case of the US, that's the optimum infinite, but also the Acuity 200 was just approved for use in the US. And then just having profilometry or topography driven scleral designs, having corneal scleral topographers to be able to actually empirically design scleral lenses is, is greatly increasing in popularity. And just the, the new advancements in scleral lens design, where it's almost commonplace to have a toric back surface and now even quad specific and some of the other amazing innovations they have with scleral lenses. And then of course, some of the new advances in scleral designs. Well, my open control and management of course is going crazy worldwide. And certainly we know that myopia is literally epidemic. It's, you know, we're all dealing with the COVID pandemic and, and it's awful, but we also have for many years been having to deal with an increase in myopia and, and an increase in high myopia, which actually results in, in a greater, if not much greater risk of glaucoma, much greater risk, obviously of retinal pathology, but I think we're also very worried about what that has meant to myopic macular degeneration. And that's truly what we're trying to, to deal with. Um, I, I always tell everybody that when I was at the Global Specialty Lens Symposium several years ago, and Professor Brian Holden was lecturing and saying that everybody who's 60 years of age will have, and if they're highly myope, will have some form of ocular pathology. Well, I was sitting there and I was over 60 and I'm, I'm a high myope and I'm thinking, well, I'm fine. And within three months, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, glaucoma or at least an early stage high ocular pressure and also had a, a 
posterior ventral detachment. So uh, he wasn't kidding. I think we really do need to keep that under control. And this just shows it again from the work of Kate Gifford. And you can again look at that right column with myopic maculopathy and high myopes. That's, uh, that's really scary. So how can we slow it down? Obviously, I'm going to talk a few minutes about orthokeratology, but we do know we're making great advances with peripheral plus soft lenses and in, in combination often with a low dose atropine. So we've, we've made a lot of progress uh, in the uh, last several years. Now, ortho K we know is just simply trying to reshape the cornea to reduce refractive error. And it has certainly had a great amount of success on low myopes, uh, low to maybe moderate, and it also does slow down the progression of the disease, of the condition. So that's, you know, that's really made advancements. I think in our clinic, we probably looked at nine or 10 designs and they all work, which is one of the take home messages on ortho K is that all the designs tend to work. Uh, good candidates are, are those who are able to do it and young people, obviously, the magic age always seemed to be eight years of age, but, uh, but you can go younger than that if, if they're motivated and their parents are very uh, helpful or going to be very helpful in their care. Usually the lower myopes, um, what typically will happen is wearing ortho-K lenses will reduce with the rule cylinder but it will increase against the rule. So against the rule candidates are, are not good. Neither are patients who have large pupils because we're dealing with treatment zones that are around five to six millimeters. And if they have pupils that are that large or bigger, um, then they're gonna have a, a tremendous amount of glare. When they wake up in the morning, they take the lenses off and that treated area is uh, actually outside of the pupil. So I did, I was at a meeting one time and I think I was moderating the symposium and a gentleman from China gave a lecture on how his lens design could reduce myopia by nine diopters. And I'm thinking, you know, I, anatomically, that's almost impossible or you're gonna have to have a very small treatment zone. So this is the first time I ever came up with something with my name on it. And I thought, well, I thought of a design that could reduce myopia by nine diopters. And here it is, I call it the Bennett lens. Basically it takes the cornea and shoves it all the way back to the retina. And that's the only way I know that you can get that much. Uh... We do also know one of the studies we did was the SMART study and it was a three year study. And we looked at obviously with young people, what occurred over time. But the key result in this study is it's buried in this slide, but 80% of the eyes were successfully fit with the first lens fit empirically. We fit these lenses empirically and we had 80% first fit success. Well, that tells you how good the manufacturing is today of these designs. We, initiated a study that ultimately was done by Joe Barr uh, at Ohio State, and they compared the vision of a soft lens, the corrected vision of a soft lens, uh, which was happened to be focused night and day versus uh, a corneal reshaping design. And they found that the corrected vision of the soft lens and the uncorrected vision of a CRT wear were essentially identical, both in high contrast and low contrast. So the, the visual results of unaided vision actually turn out to be uh, quite good if you select your patients uh, accordingly. I alluded to this a minute ago, and there was a recent study that was just published uh, with four other designs, ironically. And this, this is a study that Nina Tahan did many years ago. But if you look at it, it's four common uh, ortho K designs. They all ended up with similar results. And that's what we, we found ourselves as well. We know through the work primarily of Jeff Walleen and pa Pauline Cho, that if we look at um, 
and Pauline used spectacle wearing young kids and Jeff Pauline used soft lens wearing young children that if they're wearing soft lenses or spectacles, they progress in their axial growth at a fairly normal rate. But if you put them into ortho K or uh, in this case, CRT, both ortho K designs, then you have about half the axial length growth that you would have otherwise. So really we can dispel a lot of the concerns about ortho K, much quicker adaptation. I know in, in working with kids, by the second or third night when, they, when the lenses were put on their eyes, they, they really didn't complain, really didn't feel them. The first night they did, but then they would fall asleep. So much quicker adaptation. These are large GP lenses that, that fit relatively tight. So therefore you're really going to be in a position where they have better initial comfort than they would with standard GPs. We found the studies, particularly with Jeff Walleen, that the great majority of kids successfully adapt and can handle ortho-K lenses. We also know that the majority of reports uh, of corneal ulcers have been from Southeast Asia. And a recent study by Mark Bollamore found that really the incidence overall in microbial keratitis and ortho-K is essentially identical to extended wear in general. And we know now today that you can fit these empirically with very good first fit success. We also know how it works due to the efforts of Earl Smith in the United States, and this is from Helen Swarbrick, but we know that tip, traditional contact lenses and glasses placed in front of the eye result in obviously a, a good focus on the fovea and central retina, but in the periphery, it's basically a peripheral hyperopic defocus. And what a peripheral hyperopic defocus means is that's like a go sign for eye growth. So the eyes you know, continue to grow. Well, what if we use devices that create a myopic defocus and bring that peripheral shell in? That's more or less a stop sign for eye growth. And an ortho K lens does that due to its its lens design having a, a reverse curve uh, geometry. We think maybe with the peripheral plus power soft lenses might be working on the same principle as well. So we want 50%. Uh, that's kind of our goal to reduce myopia progression. And for example, if you have a a minus one diopter myope at age eight, and, and he progresses a half diopter a year to age 16, then he would become a five diopter myope. But if you have a 50% myopia control device, then he'll only become three diopters and his risk of complications later in life is greatly reduced. And we really do get that with ortho K. This is some of the older studies actually, but overall we get close to 50% reduction with ortho K. Right now, uh, peripheral plus soft lenses, which I know in the US we're, we're talking about biofinity um, and natural view one day and now the MySight lens, uh, have enjoyed some success as well, not the same amount of slowing of progression, but they're continuing to make strides in that regard. And for patients who uh, wear lenses during the day and, and prefer to have a, a soft lens, um, these certainly are only going to get better. And you can see here, we're probably talking about 40% overall or, or 35 to 40% slowing in myopia with these designs. So in a presentation he gave a couple of years ago, Jeff Walleen summarized myopia control by going atropine has the greatest effect. Um, and that was 76%, ortho K was 43, soft 39, and then multifocal spectacles much less. And of course, what we're seeing today is a combination of low dose atropine with either ortho K or soft multifocals. And one such study was, this was an outstanding paper. It was given last January uh, 
at the Global Specialty Lens Symposium. And what they looked at was ortho K uh, combined with low dose atropine compared to ortho K alone. And they really found there was a significant difference um, early on if you use both together. Afterwards, there, there really wasn't, but early on it, it appears that a low dose atropine, either 0.01% or 0.05% uh, will be something that we may become commonplace uh, in combination with either ortho K or soft molecules. We ask just, and this will be out, um, I believe, no, this is from last October from the GP update article. We asked the readership of contact lens spectrum what they use. And you can again see soft molecular vocals uh, are used the most as part of their toolbox for myopic control and ortho K. There's several resources uh, as we think about uh, working with ortho K. There is actually mm, in, I'm trying to think two weeks, the Global Myopia Symposium, which would be a virtual symposium that I would highly recommend, uh, the GMS. But we also have uh, the, the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Uh, the GPLI has several consumer and practitioner resources. Um, and then some great tools from Kate Gifford and her group in core uh, both practitioners and for patients. This is our new myopia management brochure from the GPLI. It was written by Jeff Walleen, and we think it's a, a nice um, resource to be able to provide. You can get it right from our website, gpli.info. Um, I'm not proud, that's my wife and that's my daughter. Um, and then right here is Kate Gifford, who helped contribute to the brochure. So um, this is one resource you can use. Well, let's switch gears now and we'll go to materials. Well, what's going on in 2020 in terms of GP materials and coatings? And a lot of people go, hey, there's not been any improvements. GP materials have been about the same. and I. I'm, I'm an older person, as you can obviously tell by my gray hair, and I've seen lots of improvements. You know, I go back to the PMMA days, and I'm a 53-year wearer of rigid lenses, so that gives me a little bit of experience. But what I have seen is obviously we're seeing more uh, oxygen permeable materials, and I mentioned that just a minute ago. But we're also able to obtain more consistent surface wettability, and I'll talk about that in a minute. These lenses are much less likely. And then the analogy I always like to use is 30, 40, 50 years ago when I would play golf and I would hit a bad golf shot, I'd put a big dent into the golf ball. The same thing would happen with the early GP materials. If you dropped one and picked it up, it's very likely you scratched it. And today's materials don't warp as easily and they don't scratch as easily. And it's just like with a golf ball. Today, I still hit bad golf shots, but I don't dent the golf ball. What about the materials themselves? The low DK materials, and there I would recognize 25 to 50, and DK is the oxygen permeability of the material. So those would be fine for daily wear myopes. Uh, a high DK material, which essentially would have twice as much oxygen, uh, would be great for hyperopes. Remember that a plus lens is about twice as thick as a minus lens on average. So you need twice the decay, but also you would need that for somebody, um, most of the mobile focal designs, keratoconus, you need a higher decay material. Your hyper decay materials, you can really fit anybody to. Uh, we, we certainly want to use them in corneal reshaping and scleral designs and anybody going extended wear. But the bottom line is your laboratory is really good at matching the material with the, the patient's specific lens design. I mentioned earlier that there are a couple 200 DK materials and I, I can't speak specifically for uh, all the other countries in terms of who has uh, 
for example, what India has access to versus what Europe and, and everybody, but um, certainly at, at our home, these are the ones that we're using and using predominantly along with Minicon Z for our um, scleral lens designs. Tangible hybrid peg appeared a couple of years ago, and it is, people think of it as, as a surface uh, treatment. It's actually a, a, a coating that encapsulates the entire lens, and it is a, a godsend. It's been great to have for us. And it is, the, the lenses are plasma treated, and then they're soaked in these tangible peg polymers for 90 minutes and it forms this wettable shell over the lens. This is for patients who have dry eyes, um, your presbyopic patients, you know, this is really, I, I would argue what we'll see is really every lens should, every GP lens should be hyperpeg because we're at that position. If you look at the bottom of the slide where the tangible boost solution, which, which could well be in other parts of the world. It's just, we're still waiting on it in the US. We're hoping um, by the end of the year to have it, would allow patients to refresh the hyperpeg coating once it starts wearing thin, because over time, just rubbing the lenses every day, and then if they would use tap water or any of these abrasive cleaners, uh, those all can have an impact on the coating itself and it'll gradually wear off but it's available here in almost every material. And once we have the boost solution, then truly I think every lens should be hydropeg just because of the wettability that that creates. Well, what about lens design and fitting in 2020? Well, of course, the elephant in the room has always been comfort. And I think I've spent the last 35 years looking at comfort and I was looking at it totally with corneal lenses, not knowing that sclerals were going to come along and for certain patients that would solve the problem. But some of the answers that we found in looking at comfort weren't the questions that I was initially considering. I always looked at lens design and we, we did a large number of studies looking at lens design and comfort. You know, we found larger diameters were better. We found lower edge lift was better. Um, ultra thin designs were better. But I think when we really started looking at comfort, those first three turned out to be uh, most important, I think more than anything other than, than maybe going to a scleral lens design. So how you present GPs, and we did a study on this and we found, we found that if you present them in a, in a positive but real, realistic manner, patients would be much more likely to be successful. Um, with GP lenses. So not using negative phrases such as discomfort, that would be a, a word that would scare anybody, but just, you know, using the, we like to use the term GP, even though we know they're rigid and they are rigid gas, where GP rolls off the tongue a little better to the patient and, and not being tentative. You think a GP is the best lens for them? you know, tell them that you, you know, you will experience some lens awareness initially due to the lid interaction with the edge. GP lenses are smaller than soft lenses. Therefore, they're going to move a little more on the eye and your lids are going to feel that, but they should become totally comfortable within one to two weeks. So that's kind of the pot of gold that you're giving them at the end of the description. And then the other factors, you know, we found top line aesthetic to be uh, beneficial if it's used prior, immediately prior to putting the lens on. And then vision is the other factor. We know design and fitting in 2020 is better because the quality of manufacturing is better. The lenses are very reproducible. I think that's really key when you get reproducible edges, when you get ultra thin designs, remember that the less mass the more likely that lens is going to stay up underneath the upper lid. And the more likely that lens is going to stay up underneath the upper lid is not only is it going to be more comfortable, but they'll be less likely to have variable vision and dryness. So now we have ultra thin lenses. Labs typically have their own peripheral curve, which is a little, periphery is a little closer to the eye. 
and it's not out here where the upper can bang into the edge. Uh, and then you, you can empirically fit. You can empirically fit most GP lens designs today. And you know what that means? It means the first pair of lenses they put on, they can see out of. And that's, that's real powerful, as I'll get to in a minute. So, you know, you can typically just provide the refractive information to the lab. And today it's commonly used for spherical lenses, toric, hybrid, mole focal, and, and actually ortho K designs as well. So those would be the five areas. And again, I will argue if they put their lenses on, they can see out of them, they'll be less aware of the, of the comfort issue. In fact, they'll be more of kind of like a wow factor. Yeah, I've never seen this well. We have several tools if you're trying, to, if you're inter interested in fitting GPs and want to learn more about the evaluation of them. Some of the tools that we have at gpli.info uh, include Click and Fit. We have a whole series of spherical lens tools, but Click and Fit's really neat. It's a virtual fitting, 15 lens fitting set. And they, there's a patient and you can choose any lens to fit on that patient. And then you can look at the fluorescing pattern. Uh, it will also tell you about the lens. It will show a video of the fit and then a simulated one week follow-up. And it's, it's a great way to learn about the changes in lens design and how they affect the fit. And then you can actually see all 15 fluorescing patterns at once if you want to. This gives you an idea that, you know, the flattest lens is gonna have the smallest optical zone and the flattest base curve. And you can see that apical bearing and if you go all the way to the other corner, you've got the steepest lens with the largest optical zone, which means the steepest part of the lens is bigger. So as you would expect, you'd have apical clearance and mid peripheral bearing. The best lens is usually in the middle. Um, so this is, uh, again, I think a good tool for really being able to evaluate GP lens changes on the, on the eye. And then there's bitorics, and bitorics just get easier and easier and better and better. Now, when, when I was in school, the, a big contributor to my, any success I've had was Dr. Irvin Borish. And I don't know if that name rings a bell to you all, but back when he was my instructor in school, and then later he's the one that hired me when I taught at Indiana University. And, and in fact, when I had a dream to write a book on GP lenses, and this is back in the early 80s, uh, when they were just really coming out, I couldn't get any publisher to agree to publish the book. One of them even wrote me and said, we don't think it's a good topic and we've never heard of Ed Bennett. So I was, I was desperate. So I contacted Dr. Borish and I said, would you author a chapter on GP multifocal lenses? And he said, sure, Ed put his name on the table of contents, sent it to his publisher, and it got accepted. So without him, you know, I, I wouldn't be having this conversation uh, for sure. But when he gave his lecture on bitoric lenses when I was a student, it kind of looked like this. You know, we, any of you remember what a chalkboard is? You know, this is what he, he was using. It looked like a lot of optical crosses. And maybe after that, I just never liked optical crosses, but uh, it's a lot, lot simpler than that. But we know we need them. Once patients get up to <clears throat> certainly around two and a half diopters of corneal cell, you start getting these types of dumbbell patterns. And you want a nice kind of glove on hand type fitting relationship, you know, not bearing, not clearing, but just nice glove on hand. And you have that. So a bitory fits just like a spherical lens fits on a low astigmatic cornea. And you can see here, a lot of times when you have a high astigmat that you fit into a spherical lens, uh, the lens will decenter on the eye. But if you put a toric uh, lens on, it will it live, it exhibit better centration. The, the other example I'll use is if you have a high astigmat, so many times we try to just keep fitting soft toric lenses. And you know we just keep trying to put a, a square peg into a round hole when you have a bitoric lens that will solve the problem. There are several methods that, these are actually ones that we have on our 
website, the GPLI website. Um, popular ones certainly include the Mandel Moore, which actually, if you just input the Ks and the refraction, then it gives you the base curves and powers, as, as many of you know. And believe me, when I, I watched Dr. Boris's lecture, I, I just, I was so confused that a, a tool like this was just a, a, you know, a blessing for me to be able to provide my students. And this is a, an example. You know, you'll fill in the K values and the refraction, and then it'll do the rest. It will vertex the refractive error. It will insert the fit factor. And the fit factor is fitting a quarter diopter flat flatter than the flat meridian. So putting it'll be a 42 and a quarter on a 4250 and three quarters of a diopter flatter than the steep meridian. So you'd end up with a base curve of 45.25. Well, where did these numbers come from? Well, keep in mind that the cornea itself flattens as you get away from the center. So it's always nice to fit a base curve a slightly flatter just to align better, bracket and align better with a cornea that's aspheric. But secondly, we go more flat in this meridian because it creates about a half diopter of tericity. And the best patient to put a spherical lens on is a patient that has a small amount of tericity. So it creates an environment where there's tear pumping and you really actually have a better fit. So it's created when you use this. If you like optical crosses because of Dr. Borish, I, I really don't, but you know, I know that that's nice to use. You can have the same example. You've got the powers in each meridian, the K values in each meridian, you can vertex it, and then you'll add the fit factor. And that's a flat add plus. You know, always remembering Sam FAP, you know, steep add minus flat add plus, these are both FAPs. So you'll add 75, to this, you'll add plus, 70, uh, plus a quarter to this, and you've got your powers and your flatter base curves. We have our own GPLI toric and spherical lens calculator where you can input the spectacle RX and Ks. And this is a little more dynamic. It kind of gives you more information. The tear lens, and uh, we'll work through an example where you have a patient with this refraction, these K values, and this is our lens. And then if we use this calculator, it will show you the tear layer that you have created in this example. And this was developed by Dr. Tom Quinn. And then you compensate for that tear lens. And so he goes Plano. He doesn't change the curvature in the flat marine, but he goes three quarters flatter in the steep. So that minus four becomes a three and a quarter and you've corrected for that tier lens. So it will say, here's what you need to order. The difference in the base curve radii are two and a quarter. The difference in the lens power is two and a quarter. So basically you have a spherical power effect design, which means that lens can rotate all at once on the eye without impacting vision. The worst case scenario is what we like to call cylinder power effect. And what I think about this is we've ordered a bitoric empirically, we put it on the eye and we do a spherical refraction and they just don't see real well. So somewhere, you know, there was a mistake made. So if this is our lens and our over refraction just happens to be, um, I'm trying to do this in my head, but it, it would be, we have Plano and so it must be plus one minus one times 90, I, I think. Uh, if I'm thinking this, I'm doing this in my head right now, but we've got, uh, no, it'd be plus one minus one times 180. So the over refraction is plus one minus one times 180 and I should have that up here. So then the over refraction is plus one in the 180 and the over refraction in the 90 is Plano. So you just put that into an optical cross, you add it to the, di to, to the lens powers in each respective meridian, and that gives you your new powers. You know, plus one plus Plano equals plus one, 
plano and minus three equals minus three. And now there's your new powers. That's as hard as it gets, is if you have to do a sphere cell over a fraction, you just add the power in a meridian to the diagnostic lens power in that same meridian. There it is. I should have had that up to begin with. So, you know, you've got the, these lenses, um, you know, you've got that power, those base curves, um, you put that on the eye, you do a sphere cell over refraction and you get this. And you're, ha you're happy because their vision is so much better, but then you're going, well, how do I come up with, you know, the final powers? And that's how you do it. You know, again, just adding by meridian. Base curves I mentioned earlier is that you just typically just use Mandel Moore or use our GPLI calculator, uh, but they'll typically go a little bit flatter um, and they'll go more flat in the steep meridian just to provide uh, a slight amount of tericity to help in tear pumping and also in centration. We have on our website, uh, quite a few webinars. I'd, I'd really recommend the one by Tom Quinn um, is outstanding on toric lens design and fitting. He makes it very simple, uh, but we also have the calculators. And GPLI is a nonprofit. There's nothing for me to benefit uh, in talking about it. I, it's just a, a resources and programs on GP lenses. Uh, scleral lens fitting applications, obviously we're seeing quite a bit going on in sclerals, they're booming. And the big reason is comfort. Back in the uh, 1990s, uh, I worked for about 10 years in an ophthalmology practice and I fit a lot of irregular corneas, a lot of post transplants, a lot of keratoconics. And there were people that ended up having surgery because they just couldn't gain comfort in a corneal GP lens. And I hate that because today we would just put them into a scleral because the sclerals are, are similar to a soft lens in initial comfort. There are different categories. Typically we're talking about mini sclerals, you know, the 15 to 18 millimeter ones are the ones that we fit most commonly. The indications, uh, primarily a regular cornea. Um, you know, we were looking at patients who have a moderate irregularity and you're not going to achieve the type of fit you'd like to achieve with, with, with a corneal GP and they may not uh, certainly do well visually in, in other modalities. Severe dry eye, it's the only contact lens you can fit on somebody that has uh, severe dry eye syndrome. And of course we fit some patients who either high astigmatism or presbyopes uh, we also can go into sclerals. Patients who are wearing scleral lenses can certainly go into multifocal designs pretty easily. So ocular surface disease, as you see here, this is really the only lens that, that you can fit because it will bathe the cornea. The, the scope studies really taught us, you know, 84,000 fits what percent we are doing worldwide into each of these modalities. And you can see about 74% of scleral lens wears are in scleral lenses because of irregular corneas. 16% due to dry eyes and about 10% are healthy corneas. Again, we do this GP update article every year. And I can tell you the one coming up next month will even have a higher percent of sclerals. I think that the percent of practitioners in, in our readership that fit scleral lenses as the go-to lens, and I define go-to as they fit at least half of their regular cornea patients into uh, that design in, in 2020 has gone up to about 50%. This is 2019, 39%, but it, it, scleral lenses predominate as the go-to lens in irregular corneas. And you can see that the next are small diameter GPs and then um, intermediate size GPs, intralimbals and so forth. And Coppin and her colleagues uh, reported recently on scleral lenses reducing the need for corneal transplants in severe keratoconus. And let's look at specifically the conclusions of this study.
I'm, I'm kind of competing with myself on that study. I apologize. But that study found that 40 of the 51 eyes that had um, were probably saved from a transplant by scleral lenses. This is another study where this is the impact of scleral lens use on, on the rate of corneal transplantation that just came out in May. And the conclusion was that if they looked at 2,806 eyes, um, and what they truly found was that physicians should maximize the use of scleral or GP contact lenses because patients who successfully wear these lenses have about one fifth the risk of undergoing keratoplasty. So today with corneal cross-linking and scleral lenses, the incidence of, of penetrating keratoplasty, which was at one time 15%, really should be probably five times less than that today because of these innovations. We know we want the lens to vault the cornea centrally and then align with the sclera. That's very important. So, you know, we always try to insert, and there's some great videos on insertion and removal at the scleral, at sclerolens.org. But you, know, you want to position the lens on a, on a large DMD, and then overfill the lens with uh, non-preserved saline, and then you know dip a fluorescein strip into the well so that you can assess the fluorescein pattern once the lens is put on the eye. And what you'll see, of course, in evaluating the fit is you'll see the cornea, you'll see the actual clearance, which will be fluorescein stained, and then here's the lens material. So you oftentimes want initially for this centrally, you know, the clearance to equal the thickness of the lens material. And you'll know the thickness of the lens material. It's on the lens. So if it's 300 microns, then, you know, initially at 300 microns of clearance would be good. And that's how you evaluate it. This is an even better photo where you can see. And you can also evaluate it with the cornea. If the cornea is about 500 microns, then this might be 150 to 200 microns, but you can compare those. And the best resource is the scleral lens fit scales that are available from, if you just Google the Michigan College of Optometry or scleral lens fit scales, you can get, obtain them um, and they're excellent resources. And this is what you want. You have good clearance and then you also have limbal clearance and then it kind of lands on the sclera. You also want it to kind of, the edge to just kind of sit right on the sclera. And that's what we see here. We have limbal clearance, and then it's kind of sitting on the sclera. Uh, settling rates, a lot of people have looked at, these lenses kind of sink into the spongy sclera. So they will reduce in clearance by usually about 150 microns. And you, you don't want the lens to be touching the cornea. Uh, mechanically, it can abrade the cornea. So that means you need over 150 microns of clearance right after you put the lens on. You, know, you want at least 200, maybe 300 microns. And so we looked at this. It was one of the studies that we did with three different designs. And they, they're all different, but after eight hours, and we think the great majority of settling occurs after four hours. There might be anywhere from 25 to 50 more microns of settling, but the great majority is in four hours. In eight hours, we found that these designs varied from 88 to 133 microns of settling. So again, that's why you, you, you need to have at least 150 microns initially, if not 200. So you apply fluorescein, perform an over-refraction, and this is where your laboratory, your consultant is, is tremendous, is you can you know, take pictures of it with your cell phone, um, whatever means you have, and if you can provide that to them, uh, it will really help in troubleshooting. The, I have a couple of cases and I'll just mention them. I know I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just mention them briefly, but these are two of the first cases I had and they were they're great examples of what scleral lenses can mean this was a 16 incision radiokeratotomy patient. She was, as I recall, 69 years old. 
did not have her driver's license anymore. And that was her motivating factor. She lost one eye basically due to retinal problems. And so she was wearing spectacles with kind of a balanced contact, uh, balanced lens. And I initially fit her into intralimbal, but just couldn't get a good comfortable fit on her. So I fit her into a scleral lens. And after 10 weeks, after a lens change, uh, after 10 weeks, she was seeing 20, 25 to 20, 30 out of her good eye. And she was able to drive again. You know, she was not able to see, at least during the day, she was not able to see anything like that prior. Um, so that was, oops, let me. Don't know what happened there, but let me. Okay, hopefully, I apologize. Hope, hopefully you can hear me. Um, no, keep losing it. Okay, now I think I know. Okay. I apologize. Okay, so she ended up being very satisfied. This is her cornea. You can see all the incisions, hopefully, that she had. And then you know, we achieved a nice fluorescing pattern with the scleral lens. Uh, she ended up being very successful. The other patient had scarring due to her pedic keratitis at age two. She had a penetrating keratoplasty at age 11. Um, I saw her in my wife's practice and to tell you how easy sclerals are, my wife sees all types of patients and she had me come in to basically fit scleral lenses. And then after several patients, she goes, well, this is easy. And so, so I lost my job. Uh, sclerals really do, uh, aren't difficult to fit. So this was one of the ones I fit early on. And when she came in, she had a very negative attitude. I fit her into intralimbals. Sclerals were just coming out at that time. And she was not happy with it. And she had several personal reasons to be an unhappy person. And I, I can't divulge that, but you know, part of it obviously was vision. Um, but she was just couldn't, wasn't satisfied. She was getting close to being able to get her driver's license, was fearful of not being able to get that. Um, I'll just summarize this and go that you know, we fit, I fit her in the sclerals, ultimately both eyes. And she ended up being successful uh, in a 16 millimeter uh, design. She was seen, she, she typically saw between 2025 and 2030. And this just shows you the types of corneas that I was dealing with um, since they were both very irregular. She ended up having a, a transplant in the other eye, but then we successfully fit her into a scleral in that eye as well. So she had, um, you know, as of a couple of years ago, um, she's doing very well. I know for a fact she's still wearing scleral lenses. This goes back maybe 11 years now. Uh, and, and the good news is, and this isn't her, this is my daughter, but she did pass her driver's license examination. And every time she comes in to see my wife, she goes, uh, how's your husband doing? You know, tell him I said hello. And wonderful attitude. Uh, so it, it's, that's what sclerals do to people every day. And lots of good scleral lens resources. The Scleral Lens Education Society, where those videos are, has a lot of webinars. So, so does the GPLI, um, Global Lens, Specialty Lens Symposium. There's some great uh, fitting books. Uh, Dottie Fidel just came out with her book. I don't have it on here, but uh, A. Vanderworps and the book by Melissa Barnett and and Lynette Johns also very, very good resources. And then we have on, in combination with Scotland's Education Society, you can download this off either of our websites. 
And it's a very comprehensive scleral lens guide, about 120 photos. Uh, we just updated it and it's, it's A to Z on scleral lenses. This, this shows some of the pictures, but it goes from indications to design, to fitting, to troubleshooting, to caring and patient education. And then this is available from GPLI. It's a patient guide on how to insert, remove and handle scleral lenses. In the last minute or two, I'll just mention GP resources. There's a lot of organizational resources and I've mentioned that all along. There's a couple of good keratoconus organizations. The International Keratoconus Academy is good for uh, practitioners and the National Keratoconus Foundation has a lot of good resources for patients. I mentioned GPLI, this is our home site, uh, over hundred webinars among other things, uh, but the most important area is education by lens type. That's, if you go to that, you'll have every category covered. And this is just webinars. We actually have, um, we try to, to have every topic covered. And we, we also have a student, it's not listed here, it's over the side, but it's a student tab as well. We have student-based webinars um, as well that are archived there. So the bottom line is GP lenses will continue to represent an important component of successful contact lens practice today and well into the future. And I hope that was really communicated today when you saw all those areas that GP lenses appear to be doing well. And I really didn't even talk about mole focals where I think GPs are, are performing extremely well. The continuing introduction of innovative large diameter, reverse geometry, corneal reshaping and mole focal designs meet the needs of both young and old patients who desire good quality vision at all distances, comfort, and convenience. You know, GP lenses are here today, they're going to be there tomorrow, and they represent a, a real vital and integral part of your contact lens fitting toolbox. And again, I want to thank Miro, I want to thank all of you for uh, listening in, and I think there'll be some time for some questions. Okay, so Dr. Med, the question. Child, the discussion should begin. I read the question, sister. Hello, Dr. Sister. Okay, uh, so I guess your your voice is cracking. Can you hear me, Doctor? Yes, I can. Okay, I guess Soli is speaking, and she's breaking in between. So I'd like to uh, read the question. Uh, you can also see the question on the chat box. And I'd like to start with the question, uh, Ajay, sir. And thank you so much, sir, for your question. And he's asking for, can we use GP lens in the patient having the intropion associated with trichasis? You know, I... I'm trying to, I'm actually, I've hit the chat, bo chat boxes. I'm trying to see the <laughs> questions myself and I can't. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see if there's any. Okay. So in between the oh, bar, okay. doctor, you can see okay. the chat. Yeah. I see it. Yes. Good question. Um, we, we actually can, but I would recommend utilizing um, sclerals in those types of cases, because otherwise it, it just, you know, the, the lashes will cause some irritation and, and I don't think GPs would really be that frequently beneficial, but I'm, I'm thinking out loud as well. If they can wear a soft, that would be preferable. But if you go with a GP, it, I would recommend going with sclerals. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. Again, and another question, are the uh, BCL contact lens, are the GP lenses? You know, I'm trying to, I'm looking at that myself and I can't remember. Uh, I know I had BCL uh, at one point um, and I would, my answer would be yes, as much as I can remember. I can't remember which slide that was on, but I, my inclination would be to say yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So doctor, like the mostly we have the problem with the bulk measurement and uh, we expect to be in the fitting that uh, the bulk should be a maximum. So 
uh, can we measure the vault before we fit contact lens by using the GP Lens Institute, as you mentioned on the uh, on your website? Um, if I understand that right, if I'm talking about vault of the of a scleral lens, perhaps. Um, so I, I I probably won't answer it because I I, I have to apologize. I probably don't understand the question. Um, because it would be the only way you can measure the vault would be, you know, having the lens on the eye and just using either, um, an OCT or just using the optic section that I talk about. So I, I, I think I'll just leave it at that. Okay. So there is the another question, doctor, like, uh, Doctor, do you suggest to feed the piggy bag lenses, contact lenses in any cases? Or if you have any experience that you feed the piggy bag lenses, if you want to share yeah, your good experience. Question. Good question. Thank you. I, I and I do appreciate the questions. I I love piggyback when I was fitting them um, way back when, I think probably over 40 years ago. And you know, the lenses were so low in their oxygen permeability that we were just, we just needed something better than just a small diameter lens that, that just didn't, uh, from a comfort standpoint or fit standpoint, didn't work on some people. But obviously we, I had lots of edema related problems, but I never forgot what the benefits of a piggyback uh, represent. And I, I think probably 5% of our regular cornea patients are fit with a piggyback maybe, and that might even be high, but yes, I do recommend it. If you, if you have a GP lens on the eye and it's either not comfortable or it's decentering, you know, obviously a scleral lens or even a hybrid lens would be options, but it's so easy just to, to take a hyperpermeable soft lens and put it underneath the GP and see if the GP fits on the soft. So yes, I do recommend it. It is one of the tools that you can use in those cases. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. Uh, doctor, I love the uh, GP lenses in suit website. Doctor, is it free for us? <laughs> yes, it, it is. The, the only thing that, um, you know, everything on the website, they, I know they have free shipping um, to anywhere in the U S but I don't, I don't know in terms of, of the shipping of resources outside of the U S but the great majority of our resources are online. So, you know, you can, you know, the webinars and all the calculators and the tools and all of that is, uh, there's, there's no, um, you know, there's no problem in that regard. If you have a group, and this could well be through Miro. If you have a group, uh, if there are students involved or whatever, and um, that would like our resources, then probably just email me and let me see what I can do to, to get those um, to you all. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, first of the kind word, doctor. I guess uh, uh, the only question so far. So we will be waiting for a few seconds here if anyone anybody wants to ask the question kindly drop the question on the comment section and we'll be waiting for a few minutes yes can we do that doctor <laughs> but no i i think i mean hopefully this is beneficial it, it's gp lenses are something you can talk about for hours uh, i certainly could and you take each one of those topics and, and go into the fitting and troubleshooting. And as I mentioned, I never even went into multifocals. And yet I know that, uh, and I'm a multifocal wearer. So, uh, you know, they're, they're awesome. But what I wanted to do for you all is to try to just give you kind of an idea of where they're used today, where they're gonna be used tomorrow and why, and, and particularly focus on the resources, not just GPLI because I'm, in, I'm involved with that. I just claimed my disclaimer, but, but also because there's a lot of other organizations and, and places where you really can benefit greatly on GP. So I, my hope is that this kind of whets your appetite for where I can go and what's out there and why I should be using GP lenses in, in 2020. And it's exciting. I, 
you know, when, whenever I die and, and I'm sure I'm older than most of you, but, mm-hmm. but I'll know that, that GPs are, are living and that they, the quality of vision, which is always the hallmark of a GP lens will continue on, whether it's in multifocals or torics or uh, orthokeratology and particularly in sclerals and many of the irregular cornea designs. And it's, uh, and hybrids should be part of that equation as well. So it, it's, it's so neat to see that those are available. You have to fit them, you know, that's the key factor. Once you fit those first two or three lenses on, on patients, then you're hooked. And I know, I know some of the people that I'm talking to right now have, and they know, and I'm speaking to the choir, but if you haven't, once you do that, you, you, you kind of feel like, hey, I'm, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'm a little better than the, than the person down the street. And you are, you know, because you, you fit what was best for them. And some patients, it's a spherical soft, some it's a soft toric, soft multifocal, but there's, as you can tell, a significant number of people, especially the people who really, really can have their quality of life changed just by you, just by fitting these types of lenses. Thank you so much, Doctor. That's such a word and it make me really inspiring. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doctor. I guess uh, these were the only question that participants have raised on the comment section. Doctor, we are about to end the session. So do you like to give some good notes or before ending the, uh, before ending any good suggestion for us? Well, I just, I just want to thank you all for having me. I, I want to, and, and for all that you're doing for, for education, that's, that's worldwide, actually, that's very much appreciated. And I want to thank everybody who, who is watching the video. I hope it's helpful. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. And uh, I just wish you all the best. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor, for, for your time. And here with, I announce the closure of the today webinar. Hoping to use you all again.